I think it's important for those of us who sometimes get a little high and mighty about how could people be so stupid as to not wear masks or to believe that we're rounding the corner or to believe it's no worse than the flu. I, I get it. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Medicine and the Machine with my wonderful co-host, Eric Tobel. We are so excited today to have uh, an illustrious guest, and that is Dr. Mark Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith has had a really varied and colorful medical career, and uh, as he just told me, his wife tells him that he's failing retirement because he continues to be <laughs> very, very engaged. Um, he holds a BA from Harvard College an MD from the University of North Carolina, and an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a board certified internist, a member of the Institute of Medicine. I think I know him best for his role as the founding leader of the California Healthcare Foundation, which is an incredible story in itself, and I hope we can get into that. Uh, prior to that, he was the executive vice president of the Henry Kaiser Family Foundation. He's uh, had a strong and long association with uh, UCSF as a professor of clinical medicine, and he continues to see uh, patients with HIV, as well as serving on many influential and important boards, uh, such as the IHI, the Commonwealth Fund, and, and other, and other uh, entities. Uh, I had the great pleasure of hearing you speak, Mark, uh, recently in the, in the heights of the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, awakening uh, of our original 1619 sin. Uh, um, and I was just so taken with what you had to say. And we've been itching to have you on the program. Uh, we had hoped to get this done before the election, but I think in many ways, you know, your insights and your, your, your uh, thoughts are even more germane now after the country has sort of come to this inflection point. So, uh, you know, a warm welcome to you, and uh, thank you for being on the show. Well, thanks very much for having me. I'm a big fan of both of yours for many years, as you know. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, maybe we can start with your career. I mean, you've had the most incredible career. Um, I know that uh, when, in the years when I was working with HIV, you were also very much in the trenches, uh, um, very much part of that at Hopkins, and then again at UCSF. Uh, tell us how you made the transition to the California Healthcare Foundation, how that came about. Uh, and for the people who don't know much about that, maybe it's worth describing, uh, you know, this incredible operation that, sure. that exists. Sure. Well, let's see. I, I, I first got involved in HIV when I was an intern at San Francisco General in 1983. And for your listeners who maybe weren't even born in 1983, San Francisco General was, was ground zero for the world HIV epidemic then. And many of the people who came out of that institution um, then and now kind of led uh, the, the world in trying to figure out what this was and then trying to figure out how to treat it and eventually how to suppress the virus. And so we used to go to interns report and speculate about what this could possibly be that had these young men coming in with these bizarre protozoal infections and toxoplasmosis and these Kaposi sarcoma, these, these um, uh, sarcomas that uh, no one had ever seen. So by the end of my three years there, I knew more about HIV than most of the doctors in the world, not because I started out to do that, but because, you know, right place, right time. And it has continued to be part of my professional and, and, and personal life ever since. Um, so I then did a clinical scholars and uh, fellowship and general medicine fellowship at Penn, and then went to Johns Hopkins and, and uh, ran the AIDS clinic, the Moore Clinic there. I was recruited to come back to California to work at the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. And uh, in that role, also played a role in helping to start up a number of the policy things that were effective, important for HIV. The, the first uh, um, guidelines group, um, the, the AIDS Society and uh, work on Ryan White and ADAP and other policy issues that affected HIV. In 1996, when Blue Cross of California was converting from not-for-profit to for-profit status, an agreement was reached 
to help pay the citizens of California back for the many years in which this company had built up uh, value as a not-for-profit entity. And the agreement was that there'd be one big foundation that was to be the beneficiary, that was the California Endowment, and one small foundation whose first job was to manage the monetization of the WellPoint stock and give 80% of the proceeds to endow the endowment, if you will. And that was the California Healthcare Foundation. There really wasn't any agreement or clarity about what was to happen to CHCF when the monetization was done. But by the time the monetization was done, we had turned WellPoint stock into two and a half billion dollars. Uh, and so the endowment got two billion and we got 500 million and our board decided, gee, that's enough to do something constructive. And so we set out to build a philanthropic uh, uh, enterprise, and that's where I spent the next 17 years of my life, um, and really kind of the keystone, if you will, of my professional career. So that's how it came about. Throughout all that time, I've most of that time, I've continued to see patients uh, at San Francisco General, in part because uh, uh, I thought I was um, uh, could be helpful. It's one of the few specialties of medicine in which there's not an oversupply. Uh, and because, uh, frankly, I enjoy it and, and find value in it and uh, find my relationship with patients rewarding. Um, the irony, of course, is that I have to go back to being a general internist. Uh, because most of my patients, uh, if they're lucky, uh, will die with their HIV, not of their HIV. And so, uh, as you both know, I've got to go back to figuring out, gee, do I do a PSA on this guy or not? <laughs> and what about their lipids? And geez, their statin the right dose. And that's challenging even for people who do general medicine full time, as I uh, clearly don't do. But I continue to find it rewarding and uh, keep on, will keep on as long as I can. Not only do I remember those times, uh, I was actually accepted to be a fellow at UCSF in 83 by, by John, John Mills, I think it was. And yes. I wound, up, I wound yes. up going to BU with the, well, in the cave. But, um, yes. you know, I sometimes wonder how the trajectory of my life might have gone had I come to UCSF instead with your wonderful talent there in HIV. Yeah, yeah well, one, one, one coincidence that brings the three of us together, I left uh, San Francisco General UCSF in 82. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm the old dog here uh, <laughs> to, to start my fellowship. And of course, that was the beginning of age. We didn't have a name for it yet, but right. they were coming in in flocks you know, right. every day right. to the mission. Right. And so, you know, it was actually kind of striking how I didn't even realize that today, Mark, that we actually were like strangers in the night. Yeah, That's wow. right. That's, and, and both of you remember the days. It's really quite remarkable. And in some ways, it's, it's kind of a, a marker for the growing role of pharma, which maybe we can talk about both the good and bad. I, I remember when we used to send, as a senior resident, we used to send interns to the airport to pick up pentamidine that the CDC yeah. had sent us. <laughs> because if you had a patient with pneumocystis that had a sulfur allergy, you were doing pentamidine. When I was at Hopkins, we had the blueprint for uh, a room that was going to have negative pressure where we could sit patients in chairs to do inhale pentamidine. And now I have a patient who's on one pill once a day for his HIV. Yeah. The two of you probably take more medicine than he takes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's really, oh, yeah. in some ways, it's really nothing short of a miracle. It's nothing short of a miracle. And it's a marker in some ways for the growing role of pharma, which is another interesting discussion. You know, when I was in business school, people talked about pharma and everybody would say, ah, well, drugs are six, 7% of healthcare costs and it's not much. Well, clearly it's a lot more than that now. And in part because it's a lot more than that now, it's become the centerpiece both of political and economic issues in healthcare because of the growing role of pharma. And nowhere is that more apparent than in the, the progress of HIV from really the Holocaust that it was when the three of us mm -hmm. were all around UCSF to the more or less manageable uh, chronic disease that it is today. It's truly really a remarkable story. I want to switch gears a bit, Mark. And, uh, you know, one of the things that stood out for me when I heard your talk, the one I referred to at the opening, is you, you talked about this whole Black Lives Matter epiphany we were having as old truths laid visibly bare. Right. In other words, this really wasn't news unless you were totally tuned out, as most of us in the nation seem to be until that moment. Uh, you know, hadn't fully embraced the pain and the suffering. Frame this issue for us of Black Lives Matter uh, from your wonderful perspective. 
Well, first of all, um, thank you. It, it really was quite remarkable to see the outpouring of support for a, 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 a re-examination and attention to, to racial justice, to social justice that came from people of all ages and all ethnicities and big cities and small towns around the country. Uh, and it uh, was the result in part of the culmination of many little things over the years, uh, which uh, at every point when you when you saw some horrible outrage and said, this finally is going to wake people up. And yet one could see the same thing happen over and over again. And, and for this spring, when these events uh, happened in rapid succession, uh, it kind of people had reached, I think, a boiling point. It is interesting in the wake of the election, as we again contemplate the structure of the United States Senate, and the existence of this weird electoral college uh, to recognize how much of American history, how much of America's economy, how much of America's political structure really does go all the way back to slavery. <laughs> it goes all the way back to the protection of the rights and power of the slaveholding states, uh, the apportionment of votes to make sure uh, that black people could not exercise the same political power that was commensurate with their numbers. And I don't need to tell you about both reconstruction and the extraordinary lengths to which people in our lifetimes went to keep black people in places like Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia from voting. And so mm -hmm. I think part of what you saw was uh, the accumulated frustration of people and the support of folks, some of whom were awakened for the first time to the complicated um, interlocking uh, issues that affect black and brown people in America. And so I was both heartened by that response, but also um, I'm old enough to remember similar responses uh, mm -hmm. and over s the very same issues. Uh, as I said in that talk, I went to the March on Washington with my father. I remember it well. And if you think about the issues that they were uh, complaining about that, if you think about the issues that uh, started the, the, the mass uprisings in 1968, if you think about the birth of the Black Panther Party here in Oakland, uh, these were the same issues. Uh, they mm -hmm. haven't gone away. And so uh, I, 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 I was really struck by uh, both the outpouring of support and by the sense of frustration that these issues are not new ones, but they were, again, laid open for people to see in a way, in part because of the ubiquity of cell phones and video, of people being able to experience and document events that in the past would have gone, uh, frankly, uh, swept under the rug or lied about. Um, so uh, that was kind of what I was trying to say. I think one thing that moved me that you said was, uh, you know, and I think it was directed at everybody listening to you, assume that you have a problem. Yeah. That we are all complicit until we are proven incomplicit. And it's inconceivable that we don't have a problem. And I think, you know, I think a lot of us sitting in ivory towers like to imagine that, you know, we, we are beyond all this. But I think there's a lot of important soul searching that the movement made us all engage in and recognize that even when we think we're doing well, we're not doing well. Yeah. Yes, it's really true. And I'm sure both of you, as you go through your email every day, it's been quite extraordinary, the outpouring of documented injustice and inequality in almost every part of medicine that you can imagine in right. the last four right. or five months with attention. Any place you look, you will see the consequence both of systemic injustice that affects people's educational opportunities, wealth, and economic uh, progress that then gets reflected in their health status and disproportionate and inequitable treatment within the healthcare system itself. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the interesting things I think that's happening now as people are paying uh, appropriately more attention to social determinants of health is that people I think who are well-meaning are quick to look outside the healthcare system for the explanations of inequity and quick to um, go to things like mm, farmers markets and transportation and uh, food deserts um, and a little slower to look at how people may be treated differently when pain control is concerned in the emergency room. Uh, 
or, or looking at their own quality measures, say hospital readmission, or even things as general as net promoter scores, and looking at those things by race and by gender and by language. Um, and so I think there's a lot of kind of glass houses around within the healthcare system. There are, to be sure, social determinants about which we all ought to be concerned. But there's also lots of issues within the healthcare system itself. And almost every place we look, we will find things we can work on to make things better. So it's not about pointing fingers and castigating people and beating on chess. It's about assuming that we have a problem, looking for the dimensions of those problems, and then as opposed to admiring those problems, getting to work trying to figure out how we can, how we can make progress. You know, to tie in uh, the whole Black Lives Matter with the pandemic, Mark, mm. I wonder if you can get some comments, uh, give some comments about, because our health system has no recognition that it's a human right to have health care, that we were exposed bare to have disproportionate hurt to people of color. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the data is, is just uh, incredibly, um, uh, so not sobering isn't say enough about how that has occurred. Can you connect the dots for us on that? So it's interesting because from the early days of the pandemic, it was really clear that black people were being disproportionately hospitalized and disproportionately dying. And the first rather facile explanation of this, particularly in the lay press was, oh, well, they have so many pre-existing conditions. They have comorbidities. Now, the, the, the first problem with that is that no one ever went to say, well, gee, why is that the case? So that's number one. But second, it became clear that that wasn't exactly all the answer. And as one began to see, for instance, dramatically disproportionate impact on Latinos and Latinas in California, where some of these historical uh, disproportionalities of obesity and hypertension and diabetes didn't exist, it became clear that a lot of people's risk was not so much medical risk, but social risk. Where did you work? How did you get to work? How dense were your households? What opportunities did you have to work from home as opposed to having to go in and be an essential worker? Isn't it interesting how our definition of essential has changed yes. in the course of the pandemic? Yes. For, for many people, essential is it is essential that you work to bring me things, right? Food, toilet paper, et cetera. And so the, the, the pandemic has exposed, I think, at least three things. One, it is true that for many populations, including the African-American population, pre-existing conditions and comorbidities that are rooted in these social determinants make you at greater risk. Second, for many populations that are distinguished both by race and by economic position, your social position in society, the kind of work you do, the density of your household, your ability to work from home, your ability to travel in a way that doesn't have you next to 50 other people inside, puts you at special risk for infection and therefore for illness. And the third thing is, it's now clear if you go to a well-resourced institution, you have a better chance of doing well than if you mm -hmm. go to a poorly resourced institution. So we're now beginning to hear anecdotes and in fact now some data about people who were turned away and told, go back home, it's just a cough, it's just mm -hmm. a cold, and it wasn't just a cough and a cold. Mm -hmm. If you think about the institutions that were more or less likely to have early access to some of the antivirals and steroids that we now recognize as being effective, the ones that were likely to have early access to PPE and to ventilators. So there's kind of a complicated set of circumstances, some of which have to do with people's medical conditions, some of which have to do with people's social risks for a communicable disease, and some of which have to do with people's access to health care, both their insurance status and the nature of the institutions that take care of them and how those resources are disproportionately allocated. It is interesting to note that the federal efforts to um, provide resources to hospitals tended to go to hospitals that had more Medicare reimbursement, mm. which turned out not often to be the hospitals hardest hit by the pandemic. And so mm. Once again, you see, it's not like someone sat there and said, oh, let's screw these hospitals. It's just in the normal course of doing things the normal way, the way we normally do them. These inequities are built structurally into the system. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Medicine and the Machine. Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine. 
featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com. I think it's fair to say that we uh, are living in a time when there's been when there is incredible suspicion of science. Yeah. And that's a, a phenomenon that was understandable, I think, in, when it comes to research studies in the black community because of, you know, uh, historic things like Tuskegee that really, uh, you know, made one wary. But it's interesting how MAST became so politicized and how even when we have good public health interventions, we're dealing with a society that's really uh, split over over that issue. It's become a political issue. Let's move into this area of, you know, this, this amazing transition that has just taken place. And yet we are left with a very divided nation. How do you see things unfolding in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, in terms of health equity uh, moving forward from your, how do we heal this nation? How do we heal the body of this nation, which remains horribly divided? Yeah. Well, I don't know that I have any special expertise or insight on that one. I'll, I'll, uh, as I say, I try to be an optimist. I am optimistic in part because I have seen so many efforts throughout society to try to get a handle on everything ranging from police reform to building black wealth to addressing social determinants and inequities in health. And I regard these as efforts of pe uh, by people of goodwill and hopeful that they will continue. At the same time, I think it's worth pointing out there have been times in our past when people have made efforts and we see where we are now. Uh, I'm hopeful that a new administration uh, that respects and supports science and does not for political purposes undermine and discredit science can help um, uh, bring the country together around public health measures necessary to control the pandemic. It's unfortunate that I think controlling the pandemic and supporting the economy have been posed as opposite impulses that either you choose one or another, it's really clear. You can't uh, hope for economic improvement until the pandemic is controlled. There seems to be good news on the, on the horizon in terms of vaccines, so that is hopeful. There's good news, um, uh, there has been good news over the last several months in terms of physicians getting increasing, um, increasingly comfortable treating the disease. And so it's clear that in addition to drugs, knowledge about prone position versus supine position and when to intubate and monitoring people's oxygenation. And, and as we've learned how to take care of patients, our capacity to get them through the worst of the pandemic has improved. And so there are clearly people who are surviving now who would not have survived in April or May. Nevertheless, you've seen the numbers of hospitalizations. We're by no means through this. And as the saying goes, winter is coming. So I think, um, uh, I read a column by Aaron Carroll, I think, yesterday that I thought was quite good. The fact that there seems to be good news in the way of vaccines should redouble our efforts to right. use kind of non-pharmaceutical public health measures in part because there's light at the end of the tunnel. You're not asking people to sacrifice indefinitely with no idea when that sacrifice is over. And so if we can redouble our efforts and if there's more clarity, more consistency of messaging, more setting a good example from the leadership of the country, I'm hopeful that we can get through this next phase with, with minimal loss of life um, that should not have happened over the last several months. I've been itching to ask my co-host, Erica, who is really on top of everything science related to COVID. I think uh, many of us turn to his Twitter feed to yeah. find the latest, latest. Erica, what is your take on the the Pfizer vaccine and where we stand. And yeah, I think Mark really hit it well. That is, um, we need to be uh, really redoubling our efforts right now because we are looking at the worst surge um, of the whole pandemic in the U.S. We're going to see already we've peaked out in hospitalizations uh, and we're going to see that keep going up and along with the fatalities. So the point about that, that he just alluded to, uh, we're only now weeks away from the beginning of the vaccination phase, a highly effective vaccination, one that exceeded all uh, um, uh, expectations. 
to get to 90%, which looks like this is going to hold up to 90% uh, without significant safety issues. That will reduce the number of people in the population that need to be immunized as well as, or vaccinated, as well as uh, hasten the time when we have the virus uh, having a tougher time to find new hosts. So, you know, there's such exciting news and it is coming at the worst time at the pandemic, as Mark touched on. So, you know, he's right. We, we should be aggressively taking control and using the simple public health measures, whether it's masks and the distancing and avoidance of crowds and the ventilation, all the things that we know that we're not doing right now. Right. It's just extraordinary. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, the other thing, though, is we need help from the government. We have no, no leadership. And we're also in this gridlock state. And this affects, I think, what Mark is talking about, too, in that we're not getting aid to the people. These essential workers and so many others who are deeply affected and we have no uh, support financially for them yeah. and nothing's to, we're, we're at standstill and I, this is this is not helping matters at all so it might be good to get it back to mark as to how do we get out of the gridlock how do we start to uh you know turn this thing because we're not that far away from light the tunnel will last several months but the light is, you know, you can, you can almost know we're going to see that mid-year in 2021 or latter part of that year. We have to just be patient. But we're not doing the things that we should be doing. Right. So, so Abraham, you asked, you know, how do we get to this place? I think part of how we got to this place was the leadership that the president and people around him and people who take their cues from him and people who are scared of him have, have exercised, have politicized this. But I, I do want to say something about why that, skepticism that denial has taken hold. The three of us live in wonk world, man. The three of us can work from home. The three of us don't have economics that are dependent on our being able to go out every day or having people come into our establishment. And I really feel for people, imagine someone who's worked, worked his way up from being a dishwasher to opened in a restaurant, borrowed money, mortgaged his house, uh, found a partner, bought furniture, signed a lease, planned to open his restaurant April 1st, and then wham, mm -hmm. his life goes down the tubes. Imagine people who've built businesses that they see crumbling before them, and uh, the landlords are demanding the rent, and they've got no... So believe me, I understand the, the, the fertile ground. I understand how tempting it must be to say this whole thing is just a hoax. This whole thing just has to go away because uh, the consequences, I think, uh, fall on, uh, on deaf ears sometimes in the professional class. And so I think it's important for those of us who sometimes get a little high and mighty about how could people, how could people be so stupid as to not wear masks or to believe that we're rounding the corner or to believe it's no worse than the flu. I, I get it. I get why there is fertile ground for this misleading um, uh, set of uh, distortions and denial that came from the top but found fertile ground, which is part of why, as Eric said, linking immediate assistance to help people get through to the, the light at the end of the tunnel is part of what you need to do to get people uh, to adopt these measures. If you're telling people, you know, you're stupid, you're dumb, uh, you know, and just suck it up forever, that's a different approach to say, here's the science. Here's kind of the timeline that we think we need to get this thing under control. And here's the help that we need, that you need to get to that point. That I think is the combination. And I'm hopeful that the new leadership of the country can put all those things together. That, mm -hmm. That's what I have some hope and optimism about. If you were advising a president-elect Biden, and it's very likely that you might be or will be, what sort of you know measures would you recommend in terms of tangible public health steps. You mentioned economic assistance, but, you know, more broadly speaking, at one point I heard you uh, in the same talk I referred to talk about defunding healthcare rather than defunding the police, in, uh, you know, because the system is so broken. Yeah. But uh, let's say yeah. you have a blank slate to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I said at the time, and I'll say again, I, I think 
the, the term defund the police is a horrible term, in part because mm-hmm. it's, it is not, what it's, what's really meant, I think, by that, by the people who first started using it is reimagine policing. Uh, and I will say the same thing about defunding healthcare. I'm not talking about firing people and laying them off and cutting their salaries, but both of you know as well as I how much money we waste in healthcare, how much money is misdirected, and the extent to which, if we could root out the waste and improve the quality, we could not only improve the accessibility of healthcare, but use that money on other things that our patients dearly need, like better policing and better education and better food and transportation. And so I, like the two of you, have been a lifelong advocate for making healthcare more affordable and rooting out the waste. I think there's lots to be done there. I think immediately a combination of clear and consistent messages on the science of public health, along with economic assistance to get people through to the other side is important. And I'll add two more things. Boy, the public health infrastructure and our public health leaders have taken a real beating in the last year. There's been a constant attack on them. I think the institutions like the FDA and the CDC have suffered. Their professional reputations and their staff, I think, have suffered by being demonized and criticized. And I can't remember the number but there's some scores of local health officers who've resigned because they've gotten criticized and have gotten death threats for all the kinds of reasons that I tried to explain before about how it is people could see them as the enemy rather than the virus as the enemy. So I think there are two other things that are really important in these next several months. One is to begin to rebuild the public health infrastructure that has been so starved of funds, not just in this administration, but over several administrations, frankly. And the other, I think, is a special effort to build confidence in the vaccine among groups who, as you say, Abraham, have reason not to be confident in it. The irony is of course, is that there's a group of anti-vaxxers, science deniers, who tend to be not entirely associated with conservative politics, but there was that group that pre-existed. Now, among progressive people, given the way that Mr. Trump has politicized the notion of the vaccine and everything about this, there's now another group of people who are skeptical of vaccines from the opposite political direction. And obviously, African Americans have a a long history that uh, tends them to be uh, skeptical. So imagine this, Operation Warp Speed, which is a military endeavor, And you now have people who are well-meaning saying, gee, we're going to prioritize getting this uh, vaccine to people who are most at risk, like people of color. And so now we have the U.S. military coming saying, hey, people of color, you're going to be the first ones to get this new Zippy vaccine we have. You can see where that is headed. (laughs) So, So from my standpoint, it's really important to make sure first that we recruit enough people of color into these trials so that it can be honestly said, we have experience and know that this works not just in an elite population that was in the trials, but that people of color have been well represented in the trials. And second, I think it'll be important to work hard to get people who have credibility in in black and brown and Native American communities, not only people in the health field, but people who are celebrities and others who have credibility to make sure that folks understand this is not some sort of plot. Uh, I, I think I would trust an FDA and the Biden administration if it says it's safe and effective and I can see that data, I would trust that. So I'd be willing to go say, you can trust this, but I think we need people who have far more credibility among common ordinary people to be able to get that message out because I'm very concerned about the combined legacy of 100 years of history and the last year in particular uh, leading to a kind of a vaccine acceptance problem that that will um, not only put those communities at risk, but frankly put everybody at risk because as Eric said, the more people get the vaccine, the safer the entire population is. You know, I was going to... Go back just for a sec uh, about outpouring on the streets of America. And during these past four years, we've seen it three major times that I can recall. Perhaps I'm missing. Uh, First, it was right after um, the uh, Trump inauguration with the Women's March. Mm -hmm. And then it was with Black Lives Matter. That went on for many weeks, if not months. Mm -hmm. And then last Saturday. Mm -hmm. 
And that is kind of different than, as you really astutely pointed out about the Electoral College and the fact that we don't have the true democracy. We have a republic. We have not the majority rule talking here. Um, and I just wonder to harness that energy that's so electrifying to see when people come out on the streets like that everywhere. Mm-hmm. They've been seen for three great causes mm-hmm. or, or expressions, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, can we, can we uh, you know, continue to, to uh, see that sort of support of outpouring, uh, you know, coming together to fight these things. I mean, we haven't even talked about guns too, but I mean, you know, that's just right up there as well. But, you know, we have so much to work on here and we have so many people who, who want this to happen, to get things on, on track. Uh, does that give you some, some hope that we can harness that energy? It does give me hope. Um, but people in the streets can set things in motion, the way things get institutionalized and sustained is through permanent power. Uh, And that's another thing that I said in that talk that Abraham referred to. The March on Washington um, was about a number of aims, some of which were achieved, some of which weren't. But the ones that were achieved, particularly having to do with voting rights, were concretized in the Voting Rights Act. It is no accident that the attack on voting rights, which began six or seven years ago and has proceeded through various levels of voter suppression, intimidation, demonization, attempts to delegitimize it with modern day poll taxes and identification. It is no no accident that that's been the focus because in the end, one can only achieve these ends through instruments of power, legislation, and, and institutionalization. And so, yes, on the one hand, I'm optimistic. I will say this, Eric, this was a very closely divided election. Mm. And it's worth our trying to remember. It's part of what I said, what I said about the people who are COVID deniers, trying to understand how that could be. So when I hear friends say, how could people possibly believe that? Well, 48% of people having seen the last four years, having seen what President Trump said and did, said, yeah, I want more of that. (laughs) Right. Um, So that frankly was disappointing to me at the same time. It should, it should cause everyone, people who are listening to this and the Biden administration try to understand what it is about the disconnect from the way we see the world Mm to the way they see the world that could have them after all we've seen and, 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 and heard still say, yeah, I want more of that. Right. Right. You know what I mean? Absolutely. (laughs) I'm not smart enough to know all of what that is, but it, there's no question that the kind of establishment of both the Republican and democratic party was taken by surprise four years ago and frankly taken by surprise again for a, a, a week ago at the uh, alienation that large numbers of people have from what was being said by them. And so I think you got to take a deep breath and say, how do you move forward trying to understand what that was? I gave you a little example when it comes to COVID deniers. And I think there are similar uh, ways of trying to understand what's happening out in the country in other areas of life. So that I think is the task. Well, and I, just to add to the, you know, you're so right about that issue, but how much of that was part of the infodemic, the deliberate misinformation, disinformation that was used to sway people to not believe that COVID was real or that people uh, were uh, getting uh, very different um, uh, messages about what was re- what was really happening then then you know compared to what was being fed to them through the channels whether it's social media or other uh, news sources that are you know just completely in another universe uh, uh, just distorted reality feeling no question you, there, there's no question there's no question that social media plays a role there's no question that the the fracturing and the kind of alternative universes of where people get their news in quotes plays a role But I think it's important for us to say, yeah, but why does it take hold, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? Why Mm -hmm. is there such fertile ground for this belief? What is it that would allow people to believe things that that seem so um, far from credibility to me and you? 
Uh, so I'm not going to blame it all on Facebook <laughs> or Fox News or whatever, because they're going to do what they do. Yeah. The question is, why is it that people are drawn to that? You know, you know I think uh, since we began talking about HIV, it's really interesting to contrast how profoundly different the science was this time around in terms of its speed and the yes. rapidity with which we found the agent and you know the receptors and the genes and so on just tremendous and here we are with a vaccine uh, you know in less than a year since uh, the onset in this country um, but one thing that hasn't changed if you read uh, you know old chronicles of the plague from Camus, La Peste, to, uh, you know, the Decameron, to Defoe, in a way, every bit of social disorder that we are witnessing also played out in their times. I think you yes. could argue that this is very much a, a human trait, and we need to bring the best of our science to these issues in a way that I don't think we've done. We've just assumed that science will, will win and the truth will be heard, and I think we need to give a lot more effort to the business of helping communicate truth, helping change behavior, uh, that, that battle is far from over. Well, you're right. And of course, you, there's no one more skilled and, uh, and rightly honored than you uh, in writing about kind of the human part of this. It is a remarkable story of biomedical progress. progress. It, it's, it, once again, our behavior, our social science lags significantly behind our biomedical science. Uh, and and while I, I hope that Eric is right about this vaccine, just a note of caution, you know, it's still early days, 30... 30,000 people um, is not a lot of people if you're talking about giving an agent to essentially everybody in the world. Uh, and there are lots of, his, there are lots of uh, examples of things that look good in the first 100,000 people and it wasn't until you got to a million or two that you realized what was going on. This takes two shots. Uh, you, there's a cold chain that's, yep, that yep. means that you're not going to be able to get it at your local drugstore. So we're early and we don't know about robustness in time. Having said that, even in the most optimistic of cases, uh, you're exactly right. In part, what we've learned about virology uh, in the last years since b prompted by our work on HIV and the remarkable progress in genetics and genomics allowed really astounding biomedical progress here. And we find ourselves once again um, uh, kind of confounded by the behavioral and social science challenges of being able to put that biomedical progress to effective use. And I, I would agree with all your points about the vaccine, Mark. The main thing I take away from it is that this vaccine's got a, I mean, this, this virus has like a flashing uh, neon sign that it's vaccine vulnerable. The right. spike protein being the target of virtually all these vaccines that are in the phase three and uh, pretty far along, you know, we're going to get there eventually. Your point about durability is also important. You know, maybe it's just six months or a year, but it's something. Right. But yeah, we, we have a lot more to see on that. Uh, no question about it. But and, you know, it's the, the other, I, another interesting thing is some of these novel platforms suggest that it may be the next time this happens, as it surely will, that it doesn't even take a year. You can just swap out, you know, a module yeah, and slap it on the mRNA and boom, it, you're good to go. So there's exactly. a lot to, lot to be excited about. No, it gives a platform. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The other thing that you touched on, which I continue, and I know uh, Abraham must think about this as well. You know, it only was a few years ago, essentially, that it was acknowledged that social uh, determinants of health and socioeconomic class was at risk factor for health. Mm. I mean, it took, it took all this time for this classic Lancet paper to finally get published for people to realize that it's just as big as smoking, as diabetes, you know. It, it, so your point about the, the, the biomedical progress and the dissociation of our understanding and acknowledgement of social determinants of health. It's just, it's so startling. I mean, really, I, I recently looked back at that Lancet paper. I said, it took us till 2017 to make this realization. So well, it, th this it, gap of, of the science, you know, sequencing and, you know, all this great immunologic stuff, we don't understand, I mean, the social science and its, its equivalency, if not uh, superseding the things that we spend all our time on. So, you know, I never did make it through my MPH. 
So I'm not going to pull myself as a, as a public health expert, but my public health friends would probably argue with you a little bit and say, it actually may have taken that long for the Lancet to recognize it, <laughs> but Rudolf Virchow recognized it 100 years right. ago. So well, there you go. Right. in some ways, it's more kind of that the two paths got separated and for a variety of reasons have now we've recognized how separate they've become and there's now been recognition in the medical world of how right Virchow right. was, you know, 150 years ago. There, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> I know you, you said uh, early on that you wanted to mention something about pharma. Let us talk about pharma because pharma has played an amazing role in our uh, response to this particular virus. And yeah. uh, I want to follow up on that uh, yeah. thought. So it's just, again, as an as a AIDS doc, I, I can't help but be struck by the degree to which um, pharma has completely transformed that disease. Now, part of the reason that I'm still seeing patients, to be candid, is because I'm an AIDS doc. If my clinical interest had been hypertension, I'm not sure I'd still be strapping them on. There's not an awful lot new in hypertension in the last 30 years. It just isn't. Uh, so HIV is in part of this amazing success story. But I think, uh, and Eric, again, knows more about this than anybody in the world, we're on the verge of, of truly remarkable contributions by pharma. Uh, we're talking about curing sickle cell anemia. We're talking about curing multiple myeloma, just things that would have been unthinkable and transforming our understanding of how certain diseases are managed. And so it's just interesting to think about the degree to which many of the things that um, have been uh, scourges of healthcare. Uh, and have been uh, fatal things, uh, HIV as the leading edge of that, but things for which we had only really very marginally effective things, how close we are to really dramatic breakthroughs. Now, of course, people have been promising dramatic breakthroughs for 20 or 30 years, but I think we're actually beginning to see some of them now, and uh, it's worth contemplating how that changes our understanding of the role of different medical specialties, how it changes our understanding of insurance, if uh, we're, we're willing to spend $100,000 a year on the maintenance of someone with sickle cell anemia, but don't want to spend 300000 to cure them of sickle cell. So yeah, it just yeah. challenges it, it ch the whole issue of pharma and its costs and its influence is one that I think is increasingly, on the one hand, tremendously exciting and, and um, optimistic, and HIV has been an example of that, but also is going to strain all of our systems for training and deploying people for financing care, uh, for building big buildings with lots of expensive beds in them and everything else, you know? Mark, you've had such a unique perspective in American medicine. And uh, what I admire most is that you're out there seeing patients in your clinic, uh, you know, <laughs> still very much on the front lines. You know, our listeners are many of them on the front lines, many yeah. of them disproportionately exposed to uh, risk uh, of COVID. Yeah. Uh, I'm very sensitive to the fact that 25% of American physicians are actually foreign medical graduates who had to make their way through a very stratified layered system and they're disproportionately uh, exposed in the inner cities to, to HIV. Yeah. I wonder if you have any parting words or thoughts to our young hospitalists, our young listeners who, uh, you know, who are at the start of their careers as yeah. we wind this down. Any, any thoughts about the sweep of a career. Well, I think they, they deserve um, our thanks and our support. Uh, one of the interesting things about this epidemic is how um, it has exposed the economic vulnerability of our fee-for-service system. Because if you have a practice that depends on volume and volume goes through the floor, uh, all of a sudden you have no income. And so I feel immensely for people who are struggling not only with the personal and family implications of their exposure, but also the economic implications that they, just like people with restaurants and beauty parlors and barbershops, have been economically challenged. So I remember back to the days when um, we were taking care of patients um, whose infectious potential to us was far less uh, than, than um, what people sometimes face now. 
Mm -hmm. um, and and my colleagues who lived through those days, and you, Abraham, among them, and you, Eric, you know, deserve our thanks. As do the people who are on the front lines taking care of people now. It 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 it, it must. And and I'm not, frankly, uh, I, I'm not at, at that level of volume or exposure. But it must be enormously frustrating and frankly angering to have people uh, masked up, gowned up, and have folks out in the community tell them this is all made up. It's nothing worse than the flu. It breaks my heart to see people going in and out of institutions with refrigerator trucks for morgues parked outside mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have someone who has the gall to say, um, they're just making up these numbers to make more money. So they deserve our thanks. They deserve our support. I think they, like other people who've been economically affected by this pandemic, deserve support to get through to the other end. But I think they deserve our gratitude as well, because Lord knows what we, where we'd be if it weren't for people who are willing to strap them on every day and go take care of people in the finest traditions of our profession. Mm. I thought so very much with my colleagues in El Paso, Texas, where I spent 11 years. And, you know, they are facing a horrendous uh, yeah. volume problem. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, other cities hopefully can avoid, but at this rate, probably a few more cities are going to experience the same level of, uh, of burden. Mm. Uh, but Mark, it's been such a pleasure to have you. I'll let Eric uh, close this down, but I wanted to say thank you for, wow. for joining us. It's just been tremendous to, to share. Uh, I'd like to talk for a few more hours. I, I mean, just, <laughs> Mark, you are, a lead, you are a light. You know, you just are amazing. You, you articulated so well. Uh, your patients are lucky, no less everybody you touch. And we are lucky to have you today, really. Well, thanks. Uh, you, you, you have an important message for, for everyone here, not just in the medical community either. So thank you for joining us. And we'll look forward to connecting you some, with some, some more because we got a lot more to talk about. That's fine. Good, good. Thanks for having me. And that's it for this episode of Medicine and the Machine. Remember, there's a full transcript of this interview at Medscape.com. Medicine in the Machine is hosted by Dr. Eric Tobel and Dr. Abraham Verghese and is produced by Medscape editor Robbie Atuma.